because that is what he specifically asked for. That would be great. Uh, more seriously, if you are uh, tuning in on the simulcast, apparently there is a video feed problem. The audio feed is coming in fine. So the problem is not you, it's us. Please bear with us while we figure it out. But in the meantime, I mean, just think of it as a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's right. Uh, my name is John Scalzi. I am the moderator of the panel today, which is called Is It the Future Yet? Um, and it's a, it is meant to be an extremely general uh, discussion of science fiction, uh, but I do have some specific questions for uh, for them. But before we do anything, we're going to, uh, I'm going to have them very briefly introduce themselves. We're going to have about 35 minutes of discussion up here. Then we're going to open up to Q&A. You, if you have been to any of the previous panels, you've already heard this. But for those who have not, when we get to Q&A, there are three rules to the Q&A. The first is questions in the form of the question. Right. How many parts are there in the question? One. Right. And how short should they be? Very. Right. Exactly. As short as possible. And as always, the reason for this is not because I'm power mad and want to control everything, uh, but so that we can get as many people uh, to get questions answered as we possibly can in the time that we have a lot of your turn. Oh, I am absolutely 100% power mad. Being lit head track of Joko Cruise has fulfilled me in ways that are unwholesome. <laughs> Yes, it's it's appalling, frankly. Uh, but me laughing. Yes, yes. Uh, but that being said, let's go ahead and have our uh, uh, panelists very briefly introduce themselves. We'll start over at the far end with Ty. Uh, I'm Ty. I write books and TV shows. Right. Yes. <laughs> that was very brief. That's what I asked for. Uh, I'm Murr, I do editing, podcasting, and I write science fiction. Okay. Uh, my name's Sochi, I do uh, novels, short stories, comics, and occasionally uh, grime rap. Grime rap? <laughs> That's a brand new genre, I've never heard of it, and I am excited to learn more. Uh, so, let, let me start off with uh, a, just a really basic question, which is, what thematically this thing is about is like, is it the future yet? And basically the idea is science, uh, science fiction takes place in the future, uh, but it is written about and for today, right? Uh, so the first question is, that's the basic theme of this panel. Is this a thesis that you agree with, you think is bunk, or somewhere in between in the magical land of it depends? And let's start with you, Kochi. Oh, I think it's, I think, you know, whether it's a story flung, you know, two millennia into the past or two millennia into the future. It's always about now. Um, I feel like it was about now when Octavia Butler was doing her thing. I feel like it was about now when um, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Like, it always feels like it's about now. And I think one of the things that science fiction can be um, particularly equipped to handle is um, imagining the and this is going to sound very pessimistic, but I don't mean it to be. Imagining the ways in which we continue to be shitty people into the future. <laughs> because like that is it that I mean evidence would seem to show that that isn't going away. Uh -huh. Or at least it hasn't gone away so far. Oh we will follow up. I, I feel that. very seen right now. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely be following up on that. But please continue. Yeah, so it's like Science fiction, in, in, in that sense, can sort of diagnose problems, right? And so we can see how, you know, our racial and, and sexual and gender pathologies might impact our ability to deal with climate change, for instance, or our ability to deal with nuclear proliferation, for instance, or mm -hmm. all these things, because, like, that stuff doesn't go away, but now acknowledging that it's going to be with us into the future because we are bringing ourselves into the future, how can we imagine it differently? Yeah, yeah. Mark? I like to think a lot about um, how other people thought about today and how very right they were and how very wrong they were. Like, 
yes, I can cook dinner in the push of a button, but I can also go to work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> how about that? They didn't think of that, did they? Um, it's, it's, it's always, that, that's how I try to write mine, was trying to think of like, what, what weren't they thinking of? And when I'm thinking about, you know, I'm not a scientist, so when I think about, I just make shit up. But I try to think of like, what else is going to change as we go, and how is the technology going to change us? The really interesting thing that I had is when I was a very young child watching 2010 in the theater, and they had both dolphins and uh, pretty much Alexa in, in their living room. And I thought, I want that AI. And then when we got it, I thought, I do not want Google and Amazon listening to me. Fuck you, Alexa. And so, you know, I did not welcome it as much as I thought I would. So I, I, we're here, but we're always moving. Yeah. So we're, 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 a, we're an older than you've ever been kind of song. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, sci fi writers are very good at, at putting a lens on today and terrible at predicting the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, all the predictions we make about the future are all wrong. But the thing that sci-fi can do is trick you into empathizing with uh, a point of view you would normally not empathize with. Right? It's it's a wrong one, so it's okay to empathize because it's not actually like uh, third world country. Right. Um, so you, you can tr you can trick people into empathizing, which I think is the great strength of science fiction. You know, we in in my show we talk about racism, what we make it not the races that exist. So mm -hmm. then people can be very empathetic. It's to, a whole new racism. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's new racism. So then people can empathize, and then maybe when they're alone, they go, oh, maybe I shouldn't be racist. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe they take some of that back to their present self. Right. Uh, but that's the, that's the power. Sure, sure. I want to go back uh, uh, to something that, that Murr said, uh, speaking uh, specifically of Alexa. And, and the idea of, as you say, like you, when you're watching it in 2010, Peter Hyams directed, it's not as good as the original, but it's still fun. When I was a kid, I would have hated the original because it had like 45 minutes of acid trip. So as somebody a little bit younger than you, I'm gonna say you're wrong. Oh yeah, no, no, for, for a 10 year old, that's the right film. Yes. Yes, exactly, yes. It wasn't bad, I'm just saying. <laughs> Anyway, but the thing, but like you said, Alexa, the idea that you could talk to your wall and your wall would talk back, that is the concept, and that is cool, but the consequence of your wall talking to you, because it's plugged into Amazon, is like, oh, by the way, did you know you're almost out of toilet paper? <laughs> right? Um, and I think this goes back to, to uh, what, what Ty was saying, is like the, the not understand, we're not predicting the future particularly well because we get the shiny bits, interesting bits right, but we often, it seems like we often miss the consequences. Is that, a, is that an accurate thought? I think, I mean, I think oftentimes we, in our search for drama, fail to imagine just how mundane the future is. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just really, like, the things that, you know, things like microwaves, things like freaking, we get the exciting bits about like AI, or even like when we're depicting or imagining oppression, like corporate oppression and our overlords and everything is a brand and it's dystopia, like we get the exciting bits, but then the fact that like, I'll be playing Madden, right? And then one of the replays after I scored a touchdown is like the Doritos crunch time play of the game. <laughs> and it's like... <laughs> You're being advertised in your video game. In my video game. You it's, paid for it. Yeah, it, and I paid for it. I paid for Sprite to be able to advertise through this video game to me as a simulacrum of like what I actually experience when I watch football. That's so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> But like that's the future, yeah. right? It's the it's the strangest thing, or all the things that are annoying to us about streaming technologies, like whether it's autoplay, whether it's like the way the algorithm is structured or the UI. Like that technology is extraordinary. It's also really freaking annoying. Yeah, yeah. It's really annoying. Are you talking about streaming like Twitch or streaming oh, like, like Netflix, okay. like like the the evil corporations streaming? Not the, not the, you know, fun gaming streams. 
So yeah. it's owned by an evil corporation. We deal with the algorithm and stuff like that too. So that's why I was asking. Yeah, to, to his point, which is an excellent one. Um, so we all read Cyberpunk in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And it was, you go into a 3D space and you're maneuvering through this 3D space and you're interacting with objects and you know, ice is chasing you. And now we have cyberspace, we have all of that stuff, and it's a blank white page with a single text bar where you just type what you want. Yeah, yeah. And it's so mundane. Yeah. It's like, it's, it is cyberpunk. We can find anything instantly, but we're not like flying through 3D space. We're just going, find me this thing, and it brings you a million hits. Yeah. And it's just the boring version. I mean, you can can have the part where you have the mask on and you're going to, and you find Zuckerman without his legs. Right. Or Zuckerberg without his legs. So. Nobody actually does that. No, no, and that's, <laughs> the whole, and that's the whole point. It's like we have we have reached that wild future and nobody wants to be nobody, there. If, if you, if I see you on the street wearing a $3,500 pair of Apple Vision Pro head whatever, I'm robbing you. <laughs> Because I want it, but literally just to teach you a lesson. <laughs> but you've seen that you've seen the videos where someone's in their cyber truck with their uh, Apple. Uh, you're looking at me like I'm making this up. No, no, I'm very looking at you like we hate that person so much. Yeah. <laughs> everybody, everybody does. Uh, my favorite application of the mundane technology is literally if when I was 15, if you told me I would be traveling around with a supercomputer in my pocket that took better pictures than I've ever been taken before, and that I would mostly be using it to yell at racists and look at pictures of cats, <laughs> right? Like, this is, the, this is the part of the future I didn't expect, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, we pretty much have the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy now, but none of us are using it to learn anything. Yes. No. Yeah. Just, just like, oh, you want to know about people, so you want to like make assumptions and then yell a lot, or you could just look it up and, and find out some stuff. But, but no, that, that's work, so. No. Well, this goes back to, I think, something you said, which I think is a, a very good point, which is uh, whether, the book, whether what we're writing is uh, today or is 2,000 years in the past or 2,000 years in the future, regardless of whatever the level of technology is or anything else, uh, we're still the same humans running uh, in Savannah OS 1.0, right? Yeah. Um, and so I guess uh, the, the question that I had attached to this was literally how much of what we might be thinking is science fiction allegory uh, about today, just the fact that humans are fucking humans, mm. right? Thoughts, anyone? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the humans have existed in basically this form that we think for about 150,000 years, yeah. and we're about 600 years away from solving all of our problems with a pointy stick. So we've had 600 years of non-pointy stick interaction following 150,000 years of pointy stick interaction. It amazes me we've gotten as far as we have. Mm -hmm. Now, any, any other thoughts on this? No, I, I want to go back to the pointy stick, but, but that's probably just, we can talk about that later. Yeah. Well, well we, I mean, I, don't, I would not uh, necessarily agree that we are entirely out of pointy stick. Oh, no, yeah. we, still, oh, we still go to the pointy stick. Yeah. Lots of pointy so yeah. pointy stick go boom. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. where we're at, right? The, the pointy stick default is my next band name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you tell me, as, as readers, when you were reading science fiction, the very first time that, or as watching science fiction, or playing science fiction, the very first time that you twigged to the idea of, oh no, this is not actually about the future, it is actually about what's going on today. What was the what was the piece of art that actually like made you realize that this was uh, the commentary about the modern day? X Men the animated series. Yeah? Yeah. Delve, delve into that. It was yeah. specifically episode either two or three. And we're talking like the original. Um, and I remember it because the animated series opens with a raid on the Sentinel factory. And one of the members of the original team, Morph, is captured and uh, left behind, and it, it, there's a whole subplot. Um, but Beast is also captured. And in the episode that I'm thinking of, Mag Magneto, leading the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, crashes into the facility and like rips open the wall to Beast's cell and is like, hey, 
come with me, I'm breaking you out, and Beast is like, no, I'm going to submit myself to the human justice system. <laughs> da, 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 da. And they, they have this very, very, very explicit discussion of like integrationism versus segregationism. Like, while Beast is in this cell and Magneto's like floating outside of it in his like electric bubble. And like at that point, as a kid, I kind of knew who Dr. King and who Malcolm X were. And I knew enough that I realized I was, <laughs> I was literally watching like, you know, 1960s philosophical, like social philosophical discussion happening in this kid show. And I think that was the first time that I was like, oh, you can have this thing that like bears little to no resemblance to our lived reality. Like there's a girl that can shoot fireworks out of her fingers, right? Um, but it can be talking about us, yeah. and that was wild. Especially because that was for kids. Like, they were on some other shit in the 90s. Right. <laughs> they really, really, really were. Right. Well, and that, well, it brings up the question is, is like, did they, did anyone actually pay attention to what was being in, in that, or in comic books, because of course there's the whole Marvel thing of, you know, with the X-Men and with, with everything else, and they just, just decided that since it was for kids, it was not worth paying attention to, or what? I think they, I think the, maybe the thinking on the creative side, and granted, I'm not in their heads, but I'm wondering if they thought that the suits would be like, oh, this is for kids, so they're not gonna pay attention, so we can slip in whatever social commentary. You know, it's like with Shrek. You watch Shrek as a kid, and you're like, ha 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 ha, and then you watch Shrek as like an adult who like gets the jokes and the innuendo and, and, innuendo and everything, and you're like, Oh, I can't believe they let me watch this as a kid. Yeah, yeah, it's working. <laughs> Having met a lot of studio execs, I'm guessing they just didn't get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know that's what the message. Did was. you get it in on time? Is yeah. yeah. Will it sell uh, lots of commercials for Capri Sun? Will it sell lots of toys? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Mer. I don't want to go after Tochi. Yeah. <laughs> The only thing that came to mind, and it's it's partly your fault because you mentioned animation, and I got one thought, and then I thought, no, let's not go there, and then it just kept going and going. I thought, I'm going to say this after Tochi says very smart stuff, and I'm going to feel very bad about myself on stage, but it won't be as bad as the other night when I did karaoke. So, the Smurfs. <laughs> yes. And I don't think they meant it. They were not. There was not subversive thinking, but it was reflecting the world as let's have one woman. Let's shit on the smart guy. And I'm watching these, and yes, they, they it, it's, I loved the Smurfs. I was the perfect age for it, and I just kept going, really good. Is, it, is this how we're seen? Is this what, I, if, if I wanted to be a Smurf, they'd be like, no, no, we got one. We're good. And it, it just, I think just the fact that it, it, it wasn't even trying to be subversive, but it did start making you think about, wow, they, they, and what they did with the Smurfs is they tried to give you huge diversity. There's a hundred of them. They each have different things about them, and the girl, and the old guy, and, and they made the smartest one the jackass. And I just thought, this, this, I'm starting to see how it's reflected, and I don't like it. But, so yeah, Smurfs. We can talk again about X-Men. Not only that, but the girl was a brunette when she was evil, oh and then God. becomes blonde when she's good. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Says the white-haired man. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I used to be a brunette, but I turned out. And what's yours? Uh, so mine is not as nearly as smart as either of these guys. Uh, so uh, my, my uncle was fought in Korea, and I, I heard many of his stories, and all of my friends were the same age as me. Their fathers were in Vietnam. Right. And then I read Forever War, and somewhere in the middle of Forever War, I'm like, wait a minute, this is just Joe talking about Vietnam. Yeah. That's what this is. Yeah. And it was that, that sort of lights on moment of like, oh, this is just about Vietnam. And then from then on, every time I read a book, I'm like, what is, what is the current thing that this book is actually about? But that was the first one was Forever War. Yeah. Actually, actually but my problem is I'm very literal. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't want to be, but I am. And I remember I was talking to Cameron Hurley about Stephen King's The Long Walk, which I absolutely love. It's got its flaws, but I love it. And I'm just like, but I don't That's care. Richard Bachman, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They write so similarly, I just mixed them up. Um, but at the end, when 
instead of winning, the kid just starts running. I'm like, I don't fucking get that. And Cameron's like, it's about the Vietnam War. And I read it again, I went, oh, <laughs> everything makes sense now. From the very beginning when they're like, yay, Major. And then later in the middle, they're like, fuck you, Major. Major shows up, yay, Major. And it's just, OK, I get it. So I, I, this is why I say the Smurfs. And I, it's just, I'm very liberal, and I just have to accept that about myself. Oh, no, and it's perfectly fun. Thank you, yes, John. Yes, I, I accept you and, and your literal self. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. But I do think it's it's also interesting because we were talking, you were talking about how Octavia Butler was writing about now, and then uh, uh, Mary Wilson Crashelli was writing about now. Um, you mentioned Forever War, which not only is about now, when he wrote it in 1974, 75, uh, but is also in conversation with Starship Troopers. Oh yeah, which was also about now. In many ways, it's kind of a rebuttal of Starship Troopers. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And that's but that's one of the things that I find really interesting about science fiction because in writing about now, it does have those conversations where, and part of it is because it used to be such a small genre that everybody read everything. Uh, but part of it is also uh, because uh, someone would read, like Alderman would read Starship Troopers and be like, really? And then, and then we get uh, the, a forever war about that. And so I, I'm kind of interested in the, the tension between the nouns, you know what I'm talking about? Um, and to, to some extent, do you think that the conversation that science fiction has with itself and its various nouns is specific to science fiction and fantasy, or is that uh, or is that just a general thing with literature anyway? I mean, I, my impression as, as someone who hasn't read nearly enough is that the, where the conversations decades ago used to be between and among spectric writers, I think now there's much more of a dialogue between spectric and like, whatever you want to call it, lit fig, realistic, realist fiction, et cetera, et cetera, to the point where, you know, you can have um, a queer Asian American retelling of like The Great Gatsby, for instance, or mm -hmm. you can have- uh, Does that exist? Because Isn't that, isn't that- uh, Me, 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check that out. Yeah, so like you can have, you can have stuff like that. And like, Riot Baby, um, for instance, was in conversation with um, Richard Wright's native son, uh -huh. and also I wanted to be in cut. So, because like two of the two of the books that probably made the biggest impression on me in high school, although not for the reasons that were intended, were Native Son and Invisible Man, mm -hmm. and those were. Those were two of the books that I had in mind when I wrote Riot Baby, so that I found, but at the same time, Pete Jelly Clark, who I also recommend, he wrote Ring Shout, which was uh, yeah. uh, this brilliant novella yeah. that's set in, I want to say, like 1920s Georgia, yeah. um, that literalizes the monster of what the, what the KKK is um, in a very fascinating way. If you read Riot Baby and Ring Shout like side by side, it can make for some very, very, very interesting reading. And I don't know that that conversation or that pairing was intended, but I think it can be one of those interesting bits of synchronicity that happen when you have enough people in, you know, in a particular sandbox playing around. Sure, sure. Any thoughts, Mark? Mm -hmm. No, I'm alright. Read all those books. So yeah, I'm no. Down. Yeah, I thought I was, yeah. well written. I want to be. Uh, so, so I'm I'm not good at talking about modern day because I mostly ignore it. But I'm <laughs> su but I'm super into um, like pre classical history. Yeah, yeah. And so I'll I'll talk to my writing partner Daniel. Like we should tell a story like this, and it's based on this Persian king from the pre Babylonian period. And like we'll go through it, and then we'll write it, and then people are like, oh, you were talking about Donald Trump. Yeah, because what it turns out is humans do the same stupid shit over yep. and over and over, yep. and over again. Yeah. So if you write about some guy 2,000 years ago, everybody will see the current political leader in that, yeah. even though it's not. And it turns out, you, what you were talking about earlier, is we just do the same dumb shit over and over again. So no matter what period you write about, there will be a modern equivalent of that. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, I did think of one. It's not science fiction, but um, every year, NPR on July 4th, NPR put on Twitter the Declaration of Independence line by line. Mm -hmm. And um, I apologize for being an ugly American who doesn't know my own stuff, but I know that, that I don't know when they name King George, but most of it is he has done this and he has done this and he has done this and Republicans freaked out because they were reading this, he has done all these terrible things and they're like, you can't put this on Donald Trump. <laughs> Trump was never mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And King George probably was mentioned here at the beginning, but they missed those because it's Twitter and you only get a little bit of time. But I just watched this unfold. They got so angry and it was just the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. I mean, to be fair to Donald Trump, he didn't quarter anybody in anybody's houses. No. Not that we know of. Not that we know of. There may have been clandestine efforts about it. Uh, when, I, when I wrote the inter interdependency, um, one of the things that I was, uh, that was a lodestone of that was thinking about the, um, the European age of colonialism from basically the 15th century to, to the 19th century and how much more difficult that would have been if there weren't ocean currents, or that, that particular ocean current that they used uh, to get from Europe to the Americas and back again. Uh, and that became the impetus for the flow. Um, and, uh, but everybody was like, well, obviously it's about uh, ecology today. And the thing is, is I'm not going to argue with that because they're not wrong. Um, but, it, but the impetus, again, was something else uh, that they just, but you just see the similarities no matter what you do or where you go. So. And we also can't control what people, how people read our stuff. Yeah. Right. Which is, a, which is another interesting aspect. I mean, speaking as, uh, writers, has there been something where you are analogizing something that's going on now uh, and someone else has just read it completely different uh, and, and in a way that either, uh, not that you rejected, but that was like, oh, I, I guess you're not wrong? Has there ever been anything like that in your experience? Well, there was the one we talked about earlier where sure. um, I but, my first book, Love, I Think, Waves, it has a character running around spilling all the information he gets to everyone and causing chaos because of it. Um, and that book was written a year before WikiLeaks, but it came out about the same time. Yeah. So everyone's was like, oh, you're writing about WikiLeaks. No, it was accidental. Yeah. It was totally accidental, but people thought the book was about WikiLeaks. Sure. Love sure. when that happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, that's one of the questions I had. The thing about getting lucky with your, you know, with your writing about now. I mean, a starter villain came out this last year uh, and got lucky in, in, in three ways. Uh, one, billionaires acting poorly. Um, oh, that's totally a new thing. I know, it's totally, <laughs> totally never happened before. But just in the sense that it's very, very specific. Uh, uh, two, uh, it was hot labor summer last year uh, and there are strikes in the thing. And then uh, cetaceans going after humans uh, in, the, in, in the Mediterranean. Yeah, I called that. <laughs> Uh, so I guess the question is, is like, in your experience, was there something that, uh, that uh, when people pointed out something about it, you were like, oh, you're not wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always tough if you're writing, if you're writing from the experience of a person of color because so many of the difficulties of being a person of color in America, um, whether you're depicting them literally or allegorizing them, are and have been interminable. Like a lot of it is the a lot of it is the same shit dressed up differently. And Riot Baby was very much about the interminability of like the difficulty of the black experience in yeah. America and how how it was historically, how it has been through the present, like you know Rodney King through Harlem in the two thousands to the near future. The book came out January twenty twenty. And about five months later, uh, George Floyd was killed. And around that time, it's this very morbid thing that happens where whenever there's this paroxysm of, of racial tragedy, or at least racially infused tragedy in the United States, books by black authors tend to you know, start to do, if not well, then better than they were doing earlier in the year. Sure. Um, and Riot Baby ended up being one of those books that people decided was like a book of the moment. And so 
you know, it's not wrong to say that there is some element of luck in the material benefit that accrued to me, mm -hmm. um, but it's the most morbid type of thing. right, and, and it's and it's interesting how widespread this mocktail of feelings is amongst creators of color whenever this thing happens that because like something like that in, and a lot of what happened afterwards with regards to the you know police assaults on people throughout cities in America was depicted in Riot Baby and there's there was even I think it was a police station somewhere in in um, maybe Minnesota uh -huh. that got set on fire like on one of the first nights and that was like that image was like in Riot Baby. Right. Um, so it's, with regards to the, the predictability of it all, I mean, oftentimes when you're a person of color, you're, it's the broken clock thing, right? Yeah. At least twice a day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, you can always, you can always be on, you know, you can always bet on racially tinged violence in America. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's like the bet on black at the casino. Right. Um, if you're writing, you know, just pro tip. If you're writing science fiction or fantasy, and you want to come across as like, you know, the prophet for you know predicting how things are gonna go, just like hit that fault line in American history and American present, and you're golden. Oh, I don't think I'm going to go <laughs> yeah. there. I, I mean, we wrote about how people who don't see themselves in the economic future are easy to radicalize. Right. And that's evergreen. Yeah, yeah. 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 strangely yeah. enough. Yeah. 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 Um, Martin, thoughts? I don't know. I played a lot with inheritance law. So um, I'm not sure if, if my experience relates. I haven't done a lot of uh, allegory that I know of. If, if I did, it was... It was uh, but it doesn't have to be allegory. It can just be like any aspect. Well, I mean, I've had... I wrote a story about the magic of Zuzu's bell at the end of um, at the end of It's a Wonderful Life. It doesn't actually give Clarence wings; it gives Satan's wings, and Satan's about to rise up and destroy us all. And someone read that and went, "Oh my God, Satan was 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 uh, forgiven, and and he's led back into heaven." And I went, "Uh huh." <laughs> it was a 100-word story. I could not have made it any clearer. They got out of it what they got out of it, and I can't control that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry. I do like that interpretation. You know, it's sweet. It is it sweet. Is sweet. That is not what the author intended. It's like if Frank Capra did an adaptation of your story. <laughs> I think that might be the, the interpretation. When Cthulhu got his wings. Yes. <laughs> Oh shit, I want to write that again. Oh, no, I want you to write it. Plain. All right. All right, that's yeah. yours. That is it. Uh, we are going to, uh, I'm going to ask a couple more questions. Actually, I'm just going to ask like, one more question, then we will open up to questions. So, uh, and the questions, the, there's a microphone here, there's a microphone here. Uh, if you have mobility issues, raise your hand. Uh, or otherwise let us know that you are uh, wanting to do that. We will run out a microphone uh, to you. Have you had the thing, Charles Strauss talked about the thing, he was writing a, a book that is near future. Um, and uh, he was writing very specifically, I think, about a, uh, an uprising in a particular place, and I can't remember where, but it was somewhere in the Middle East. Um, and as he was writing it, uh, an uprising took place in that. Yeah. Uh, so, and, 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 and he was like, well, fuck, because now I can't write this book anymore. Yeah. Has there ever been a time where you were writing something speculative and you found the aspects of the real world just bumping right up on you and you having to make any changes to it? Has that ever happened to you? Uh, or is it, that something that you can really worry about? It happened, but I didn't make any changes. Oh yeah. Okay, that's good. Tell me. Yeah. So um, in in the like beginning of the second section of the live, you see a lot of people walking around wearing masks, mm -hmm. uh, particularly surgical or N95 masks because the air is a bit poisonous. And I wrote that section of the book, or at least the you know what would become that section of the book in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of pandemic imagery. There was, you know, people coming from space who had to like wear filtration 
devices on their faces because yeah. of the air and all that stuff. Um, there were air purifier technologies. Um, and I don't know, I think a lot of it is just like you, you look at what's going on now and you sort of extrapolate it into the future and there's a lot of that going on in Goliath, but a lot of also what's going on in Goliath, there's a section about this place in Louisiana called Cancer Rally um, that uh, is in the shadow of like a huge like rubber factory or whatever that poison the, the ground and the water and everything so much that like the entire community, if you don't have cancer, you know somebody who has cancer or who, is, who has already died of cancer. Um, and that place like already exists. Yes, yeah. it, it existed when I was researching and writing the book. Yeah. Um, but it sounds so dystopian to like talk about. Yeah. It. Um, so yeah, I just like kept going. I'm like, I, if I were to take this out, there's so much I would have to change, and I'm really lazy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I embrace the laziness. Well, uh, let me ask a, a, a different version of that then, um, and, and then we'll get to the, the questions. In the sense of, uh, in the sense of world building, in the sense of, uh, of, of doing that sort of thing, do you think it's uh, easier to write world building that takes place in the near future, like 20, 30, 50 years in the future, or 100, 200, 300 years? Because I have definite opinions of that, but I'm, I'm curious uh, how that I, I, I like writing hundreds of years in the future so that nobody thinks I'm talking about them. Right. <laughs> like, I'm totally talking about them, but I disguise it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. It, it, so one thing you have to be really careful of if you're an old dude um, is not stealing somebody's lived pain uh -huh. to turn it into entertainment. Yeah. You've got to be very careful about that. And uh, so if you want to talk about things like, you know, uh, racial inequality or access to resource inequality, you know, those sorts of things, um, if you want to talk about those, you're safer if you put it a couple hundred years in the future that people will feel like, oh, he's talking about me, and he's misunderstanding my lived pain, because I don't want that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mark? Um, I've, I've, my past couple of books, I've, I've tried both. Um, I, find, I find future is more difficult just in the, I worry I will not have thought about the way everything has Evolved. Even if I'm wrong, I want to think something's evolved and different or devolved. But uh, like trying to think of who has gone where, and I mean who, like as in like ethnic groups or or gender groups or whatever. And um, yeah, that that's I write I write escapist stuff. You know, I write stuff that that I hope everyone has fun reading and. Um, so if, if there is a lot of, of, of tension from the world, it's usually not exactly what we're experiencing now, but I try to take it to, I try to figure out how to take it to a different place. What I've done with my current series is, I just basically have humans not knowing what to do since aliens are so much more uh, uh, technologically advanced that we can't even stop them from just like being ugly tourists in all of our countries. So yeah. um, if that is maps onto something else, I don't know. But that that has been more fun to write just because it's like I I can imagine that in ten years or so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean Far Future is so much more intimidating for me. <laughs> like it's so into like I have because like and Look, I was a poli sci major in college, so I, I do actually like thinking about like a lot of the, the building blocks to you know civilizations or societal structures or how power you know is is expressed in different and, and stratified in different sectors and all all that jazz. Um, but I also like working off of the recognizable. Yeah. Um, it gives me it. I think it does. It does an automatic layer of signifying so that yeah. whatever points or or echoes or what have you that I want to graft onto that from a stylistic perspective, so much of the work is already done, yeah. um, and I I run the risk I run less of the risk of whatever point I'm trying to make being buried under layers of allegory. Right. Right. Personally speaking, I find uh, near future much more difficult um, because somebody will be around for it <laughs> yep. and they will tell me that I did it wrong. Whereas if I do it 1,500 years in the future, 
will probably all be dead. So, uh, first question over here. Hi. Uh, so this is one of my favorite questions just to ask people who are into sci-fi in general. Um, but what is your gateway drug to sci-fi? What was the thing that got you interested in the genre? Uh, I mean, a lot of things, but for me, the one that set me on the course like, on now is, is the first time I watched the movie, Alien. I was like, that's the future I want to see, because I, I, I had obviously watched <laughs> Thank you. I had obviously watched Star Trek, and everything is very shiny, and everything is very clean, and you never get to see, obviously now, we have, but you never get to see, like, the person who mocks the decks yeah. on the Enterprise. And then I watched Alien, and there were guys with, like, tool belts and wrenches, and they were complaining about how much money they made. And I'm like, why has nobody ever done this? And so that became sort of my mandate. And so I want to see those guys. I want to see the people who have to turn wrenches in the future. Mark? I want to say Wrinkle in Time, but it was also when I was reading Dragon Riders of Pern and realized it was science fiction and not fantasy. And she fooled us for books and books and books. <laughs> She's like, ah, you just wait. I don't know if that was actually her thinking, but it certainly did fool me. And that, that kind of opened up the idea of wow, what else can we do with this? It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, it's sort of a, a like three-part punch for me. The first, the gateway drug for me was uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Um, maybe a top five action flick of all time. Yeah, correct. Yeah. All time. Yeah. Um, but in terms of me like thinking about and through the genre of science fiction, I'd say it was a double whammy between um, Akira and Ghost in the Shell. Because uh, I was a huge anime and manga head growing up, and still am, and discovering that Akira was 2,000 plus pages of Katsuguro Otomo going absolutely just like batshit and showing me stuff that I... Duh, he, he drops a city out of the sky! I've never seen that before. <laughs> I've never, but it also, those two things in particular, Akira and Ghost in the Shell, showed me that um, science fiction and genre fiction more generally can have an explicitly political dimension. Yeah. Like you can do, and this isn't like using genre as propaganda or whatever, but you can explore very explicitly political concepts through this medium and you can make it so freaking smart. Yeah. And that, that I thought was really cool. Uh, uh, Scalzi, what you said a little bit ago about smartphones reminded me of one of my favorite science fiction bits, which is that the idea that in 300 years, cutting-edge military communication technology would be a flip phone that talks to the Enterprise yeah. is kind of laughable. Yeah. So the question is, what is your favorite way that we've gotten the future wrong oh. that comes to mind? I, I, I have a good one. So one of, my, one of my very good friends is Walter John Williams. I don't know if you guys are familiar with his work. He's, uh, he's long, long time science fiction writer. Um, he wrote some cyberpunk in the 80s, and a major plot point of his future version of cyberpunk was the hackers had to race around the city to find a payphone to plug their computers into so that they could get onto the internet. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that, that's the Matrix quandary, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I started thinking about that. You go, Tatiana. You speak Bradley. Well, uh, remember when I don't know if they still have this, but there were these little, you can't even call them scooters, but there were these, there's like a platform for your feet, and then there are wheels, and it like spins, it's like a Segway without the thing to hold on to. Yeah. You know what those are called? What? Hoverboards. <laughs> They're not hoverboards. They're not. <laughs> They're not hoverboards. I feel like that's, I, the distinction, or the, the, the divorce between what, you know, what you imagine when you read the word hoverboard in a piece of fiction, um, and what the author likely imagined when they wrote the word hoverboard in a piece of fiction, and what the reality of hoverboard has become, that's probably like the biggest, like... And the worst part is probably trademark. It's, duh, you can see the trademark symbol. It, sorry. <laughs> This passion is what, what we need. <laughs> uh, actually, mine was, I mentioned it earlier, which is uh, the time when we were doing the whole retro future thing of like, we can do this technology and this technology and this technology and we only show white people and women are at home, but this technology and this technology, no concept of anybody other than white dudes still driving the bus and yeah. the rest of us are just still, oh good, dinner's easier to make, yay. 
I just like, yeah. So this is just the, the failure to think about, you know, society changing rather than just technology. Yeah. Or even how technology would change society, because if you give a housewife a dinner she can cook with a button, she's going to go out and do fucking other things. <laughs> yeah. Because she can. Yeah. I mean, one of the great things is uh, starting out with Alien is not only is the white captain not the hero of the story, but the girl nobody likes is the hero of the story. Everybody's mad at Ripley, and she turns out to be right. Yeah. She was she was the smurf hat. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Question. Hello. The human challenge of the era is now infinite surveillance, infinite content, infinite generated content, infinite fake content uh, that can reach you about your people's extended warranty. Uh, most fiction, speculative or otherwise, doesn't engage. Oh, and everybody has their, now everybody has their own perspective and their own content that they're doing. We don't have any shared perspective, even if we did really in the past. Most fiction doesn't engage with because it's a tremendously alienating to actually telling a coherent narrative, I think. Can it, how do we, you know, like, what is the, can we engage with the fact that, like, this is what's happening to the entire world, but our fiction is so, like, here's a nice little story because that's what you can actually read and understand if it's really alienating. Well, I just agree that they, that that's never been done. I mean, uh, you know, John Brunner was doing it in, in 1970 in Stan on Right, so it's always been there, right? Uh, but also, we need to write to editors, uh, and so a lot of what we do is whether or not uh, somebody will buy it or not. So I, I hate I hate to do this in my work, but uh, to your exact question, in the second book of my series, uh, there is a guy who has a Kickstarter page to counteract a government-funded smear campaign. Uh, that is being run about him. So, yeah, yeah. like, and that was before Kickstarter and um, Go Funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it also, too, a lot of a lot of what you described, even though it may not seem on the surface that this is happening, is happening in a lot of litfic. So there are so many books now that are just like they're written in this very sort of astringent pose, where they have these characters, these protagonists that are essentially just like vapor being buffeted by whatever societal wings are, you know, hitting them about. And there are people that, you know, even though it may not be clear in the text, probably have like crippling student loans, probably are incredibly alienated by the extent to which there is this humanity overload with regards to technology and everything. Sure. Like, we know too much about each other mm -hmm. in this day and age, so there's this sort of antibody response from these characters, spirits, and souls, and whatnot, and they're, they're directionless. So like, a lot of the pathology and whatnot that is currently sort of in the miasma hanging about is being chronicled in uh, literary fiction with a lot of these protagonists that like aren't really very like nice or attractive people. So there is, there is that. I would, I would put that out there. Okay, well, uh, this question and this question, then we have to end. So, you look like a novice to the world of science fiction and fantasy, so I'm sure that your question will be very basic. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I'm humbled to address such an august company. <laughs> uh, first of all, murder the bathroom stops flooding. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> secondly, uh, I missed the first 10 minutes because the bathroom is flooding, so if you, uh, if you covered this already, I apologize, I'll go hide in the corner. Um, I grew up reading Sherry S. Tepper and thinking, eh, you're over the top. And for about the last decade, I've been, or ever since she died, basically, I've been apologizing to her ghost about once a week, going, you were right, and I was wrong. Um, are there any authors that you read that predicted the future, and you were like, no, it's not a thing, and then now you're like, oh, that really was a thing. Ah, uh, you got it right, and I did not. I'm so glad you mentioned Sherry Tepper because uh, it's, it's endlessly frustrating for me that she is not better known. Um, and I think, for example, Grass is a world building sort of thing that is as epic as Dune ever was, but it actually, like, it has. More readable. Yeah, but yeah, but it's actually, like, readable and it actually has, a, you know, addresses sort of like ground home issues. But she would be mine as well. But. Um, I would say very quickly, Hideo Kojima, um, playing Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty um, in like 2001, 
all that informa like information warfare, like all that like stuff encoded in our genes, da 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 da. I was like, whatever. I just want to fight some giant robots. And then coming back to it in the 2020s, Hideo Kojima was right about all of it. <laughs> Um, I'm, I, the thing that comes to mind for me is Stephen King's The Stand because I read it a long time ago, I loved it, and for some reason I know a lot of people were moving away from books like that in, the, in like 2020, but I just wanted to reread it. And I remember feeling like the way people were reacting to the super flu, especially there's this one part where there's a guy in Central Park going, the world is ending, and a whole bunch of kids who are sick with the super flu come and beat the crap out of them. And there's like, yeah, teach you to scare people. And I'm like, you guys are all dying. And you, this is more important to you, just shutting someone up because they're saying something you don't like. And I thought that was, who would do that? Who would go beat, uh, beat somebody up like that? And, and you know, just watching everybody react to masks and mandates and stuff like that. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, all the sci-fi that predicted the privatization of space. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's a lot of it. Yeah. Last question. In the future, will, waffle, will waffles or pancakes be more popular? <laughs> waffles. Waffles. Oh, I don't want to Pancakes hear are just waffles with no ambition. <laughs> no, I mean, I, it's, your, it's your chance to be I a pancake apologist. Well, like, here's the thing. Are we talking, like, popularity within North America, or are we looking at a more global audience? Because if it's North America, waffles easily. If we're talking other cultures and countries wherein pancakes may exist in somewhat different form but still live within the family of pancakes, I think pancakes. <laughs> Get your drinks of calling them out of here. thinking about technology and, and waffle irons will continue to evolve, I believe it. Yeah, absolutely. We are out of time. <laughs> but thank you all for coming. Hi, Frank, Merlapity, touchy on Gucci. I'm John Stelzi. Get out of here. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. And thank you, Jay.